know how special you are to us and how grateful we are that you're with us. Members, if you would, take a look around. You can identify visitors. Uh, half the members still look like visitors to me, but uh, hopefully not for long. But take a look around and let's be sure that we treat our visitors as guests of honor because they are. And we're just so happy that they've come our way to visit us. We're happy that you're here. Would you bow with me? Almighty God, our gracious Father in heaven, and we ask that as we approach you in worship, that you are pleased with our worship. We pray, Father, that you will guide us in all things uh, by your word to do those things which are pleasing to you. We pray that as we look at your word, that the message that you have for us that is revealed in your word and will be received in our hearts and that you will change us and you will bring us closer to you and you will help us, Father, as we strive to glorify you in our lives. Please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading has been made in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and that is the text for uh, the message this morning. And probably a little different than what you may expect from a sermon on 1 Corinthians 13. Now, of course, this is referred to as the love chapter. And uh, so we find 1 Corinthians 13 quoted a lot on posters and on cards. And then that's a good thing. I'm, I'm so glad that this passage of Scripture has the, uh, has the capacity to touch people, even people who may not be familiar as a whole with the Word of God, uh, have quite often experienced this passage as the love chapter. But I think sometimes we, uh, we, we may uh, not realize when we kind of forget why love is being talked about here, and that's what we want to talk about this morning, is why the love chapter is here and the message that it has for us. You see, it's more, than, it's more than a slogan, it's more than a poster, it's more than a greeting card, and it's more than pretty words that are spoken at a wedding or other special occasions. But there's something here that if, if we grasp the message of 1 Corinthians 13, completely changes our perspective and completely changes our approach as we serve God. And so we'll begin with this, this question. Why? Why? Do you do what you do? Why are you here this morning? Now, there is the sense of beauty. I understand that, and I believe that the sense of beauty is an honorable and a good thing. We are duty-bound to do certain things as Christians. We are duty-bound, we might say, as citizens to do certain things and uh, we certainly have a, a first and foremost in our life, a priority is our duty toward God. And duty is a great motivator. Now, there's another motivator, it's fear. Uh, we taught in class how that fear can be crippling. Fear can also be motivating. Uh, some, uh, for example, may, um, may say, well, I want to do what is right because I don't want to go to hell. Okay? And so they're motivated by a fear. They're motivated by a fear of maybe a chastisement from God. Sometimes children will make the right decision because they're afraid of the consequences if mom and daddy find out, right? And so fear, although fear uh, should not be our primary motivation, it can be a motivator. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about motivation. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a great motivation lesson. And what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about is about being motivated by love. Now, as if, if I am motivated by love, and, and someone made the comment in class talking about going out and, and reaching the world, reaching the community, teaching the laws, if, if I have a great love for souls, then there's this, this wonderful message of what has happened in my life, how God, has, how, God, how God has made a difference in my life, and what that has done for me, and I want to share that with others because I love them. I don't want to see anyone lost. I want to see everybody go to heaven, and I want everybody to be able to experience the wonderful joy of the fellowship of the family of God. And so motivated by love then, we have this desire to go out to save lost souls, to teach people the gospel, to bring people into the fold of God. Love should be 
our motivation. Other motivators may cause us to move, but nothing will compel us with an energy, with a vitality, and with a dedication that love does. When Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he deals with a number of issues, a number of problems that the church is experiencing. And one of those problems, as he leads up to what we have in our text here, is an abuse of spiritual gifts. And, and even the idea that uh, because I may have certain spiritual gifts, I might be, I might be a bit above you or my spiritual gift is better than yours, or I wish I had your spiritual gift instead of mine, or what have you. And so he's dealing with some, some issues there about this, and so that leads us into what we began to read in 1 Corinthians 13. It is still a spiritual gifts discussion. I think sometimes we forget that. We forget that it is right there between chapter 12 and chapter 14, and it is dealing with spiritual gifts. But it's talking about why then we ought to do what we do. And so he says, you know, he says, I could have the, the precious gift of speaking in tongues. He said, but if I do that, and if I'm speaking in tongues, but I don't have love, love isn't my motivation. He says, I'm just making noise. I'm just a sounding brass. I'm just a clanging cymbal. There's no real depth to it. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, but I don't have love, I am nothing. He says, if I bestow all of my goods on the poor, and, and if I give of myself, even as a martyr, giving my body to be burned, and I don't do it out of love, it's nothing. And so sometimes we can look at numbers, and we can look at dollars, and we can we can try to substantiate where we are spiritually by that which is tangible. And that doesn't always give us the right answer. And the question is, am I motivated by a love for God that burns so deeply within my heart, every fiber of my being, that I want to give myself to Him and His service completely? Do I love lost souls? Do I love the Lord's church? Do I love to worship God? You know, Paul could have put in here, though I attend the assembly of the saints on Sunday morning and sing with a loud and melodious voice, but have love that profits me nothing. Though I write a big check and put it into the, into the collection plate, but I don't have love. It profits me nothing. You see, you can take that principle and begin to apply it. So somebody says, well, we need a, we, we need a lesson on giving. Well, that's, that's a good subject. We certainly need that. Um, but you know what? A lesson on love is more important. You know why? Because if love is my motivation for giving to the Lord, and his work, then I'm going to give deeply because I love deeply. Somebody says, well, we, we, need a, we need a sermon on church attendance because folks just aren't faithful in their attendance like they should be. And yes, that's a, that's a good sermon topic, and we'll probably hear that a few times, but um, if I'm not faithful in worship, if I don't have a desire to be with God's people and to be in the presence of God, worshiping Him, singing praises to Him, and learning from His Word. I really need to look in my heart and see if my love for Him is what it ought to be. And then that changes everything. You see, love motivates me. Love compels me. And it's a joyful thing. It's not a sacrifice. It's not, well, I've got to block out this amount of time on Sundays before we can go with the family and have fun, or before I can, I can get with my friends because I've got a responsibility to be at church. 
First of all, you can't be at church. You never will be at church because church isn't a place to be. Church is a people. It's who you are. It's an identity. And love compels me and says, I will be there. And not only will I be there, but because of my love for God and for His church and His work and a desire to save souls and to reach out and touch people, I'm going to give myself to His service. And when the church presents an opportunity to fellowship or an opportunity to serve, I'm going to be there because I love God. And it's a matter of identifying ourselves and identifying a passion in our heart. If you could desire a gift, you know, here Paul lists a, a, a number of gifts, spiritual gifts. As Christians of the day, uh, in, in the uh, first century, we're able to work miraculous spiritual gifts. We don't have today, and this chapter tells us why we don't. Um, what would you desire? Which one of these miraculous spiritual gifts would you want if you could choose? Well, forget about it. Two reasons. One is you can't have it because they're no longer available. And the other is you can have something better. Better than any of these spiritual gifts. These miraculous gifts that are listed. And that's what Paul is saying. That's what the Holy Spirit is revealing through the pen of Paul. What if you could have a gift, of that, a talent today that you say, boy, if I had this, I'd glorify God with it. If I, just, if I just had the voice to stand up and, and the ability to lead singing, boy, I would use that to glorify God. Or, or if, if I had a beautiful voice to sing out in, in, the, uh, in the singing during worship, boy, I would really use that to glorify God. If I had plenty of money, you better believe I would, uh, I would give deeply and, and sacrificially. If, if I just had more time, I would give of that time. If I just had it, Love says, as Jesus demonstrated with the widow who gave her two mites, contrasted with all of the deep pocket givings of the others, of the wealthy, her little two mites wouldn't even make a penny. And Jesus said, she gave me. You know what? It's not about how pretty you can sing. It's about making a joyful noise unto the Lord that comes from the depth of your soul and worship God. It's not about how wealthy you are. It's about realizing that whether you are filthy rich or poor, that it's God's anyway. You're just a steward. And whatever you have to offer to him, you use his to his glory. It's not about attaining great abilities. It's about sacrificing out of love where you are and giving of God to God deeply. So Paul says, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he talks about these spiritual gifts. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. In other words, puts others and puts God before itself. Does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, does not provoke. You know, do you know how many are church splits in our history, the history of the churches of uh, of Christ in America that we would have avoided and how much stronger the church would be if we would learn this principle love does not seek its own well I want this color carpet I want this color carpet it's too hot, it's too cold love does not seek its own doesn't behave rudely is not provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth A lawyer came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. 
and he asked him a question. He was testing him, and he asked him, he said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then notice what he said. On these two commandments hang the law of the prophets. And you know what he's saying? Jesus said, if you, take, if you take this, and everything that God has revealed in his word, and our response to it, every single bit of this hangs on the commandment to love God, all your heart, your soul, all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And it starts to change then how I look at what I do and how I look at others around me and how I conduct my life and my service to God. That I want to give God everything that I am because I love Him so much. You know what He did for me. He sacrificed His Son. And there is no greater sacrifice than that. If you have a child, a son or a daughter, you understand that. You understand just exactly what is entailed in the idea of sacrificing your son and your daughter. And God did that so that you and I could come to him. He did that so that you and I could live with him, so that we can have a hope of dwelling with him eternally in heaven. And oh, when I think of that, and I think of what God has done for me in just a moment as we, as we share in fellowship, with that sacrifice that Jesus gave for us as we eat of that which is his body, and that which is his blood. And we remember the sacrifice that he paid. It compels us to love God deeply, love God richly, and to sacrifice all for him. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. You know, the, the spiritual, miraculous spiritual gifts that the people of the day were able to have, Paul says, you know, there's coming a time when, when these things are going to fade away. He says it like this. He says in verse 8, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. And whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Prophecies will fail. Now, God's prophecies never fail in the sense of not coming true. So that's not what he's saying. He's saying they will stop. There will stop being prophecies. And there will stop being tongues. And there will stop being the special revelation of knowledge as God's word is revealed. All of these things are going to stop, but something greater, something greater is there it's already there and will continue and it will never fail. And if I seek that, then I have something greater than all of the miraculous spiritual gifts combined. He says, love never fails. He says, now we know in part and prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now he is talking about specifically miraculous spiritual gifts, and he is talking about specifically here the fact that these gifts are given uh, for the means of confirming the word as it is revealed. And he says, now we know in part God's revelation is still being revealed. As a matter of fact, Paul in the very process of writing this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is doing just that. We have it recorded in our New Testament. And he says, but when that which is perfect has come, and perfect there means complete. And a lot of times people read this and they, they say, well, you know, he's, he's saying when Jesus comes. No, that's not what he's talking about. That's not the context here. He's not talking about when Jesus comes for the judgment. He's talking about something that happened long before then. It's already happened. The completion of God's will has taken place. We no longer prophesy in part. We no longer know in part. We no longer see dimly. Now we see face to face. We see very clearly God's will as it has been revealed to us. Now what's going to happen? He says when this happens, when the completion of God's will takes place, then that which is in part will be done away. The cessation of miraculous gifts will happen. 
when that happens, there will be something yet that will prevail, and that is love. Love will prevail. And so we ask the question, why do you do what you do? I believe that you do it out of love. I believe you do it because you desire to serve God. I believe that you do what you do and you're here this morning because there's something in your heart. And we want to ignite that and we want to fan that flame to the extent that your only desire is to serve God. Oh, that doesn't mean that you no longer love your wife. As a matter of fact, you love your wife more because you love her with the love of God. That doesn't mean that you no longer care for your family. Oh, no. You care for your family with a greater passion than you ever did because you do it through the love of God. It doesn't mean that you quit your job. No. No, not at all. You realize the necessity of honesty and you work your job as an honest employee or you serve as an honest employer because you do it through the love of God. And you'll give an honest day's labor for an honest day's wages. And all of a sudden, everything about my life begins to be seen through my love of God. Love never fails. And every relationship that is right grows, and every relationship that is wrong stops. Anything and everything that stands in the way of my relationship with God doesn't belong in my life. Did you, you get that? That may be music that I listen to. It may be movies that I watch. It may be books that I read. It may be certain friends. But if it stands in the way, if it hinders, if there's something unholy about it, and it hinders my relationship with God, my love for God says, that's got to go. And then we began to, to seek holiness and purity in our lives, not just for the sake of being holy and pure, but because we love and we worship and we serve a holy and pure God. And we work with a passion and with a fervor because of our love for God. These spiritual gifts that Paul discusses are wonderful within themselves, but they pale in comparison of love and without love being their motivation, he says they are nothing. We understand the purpose of these spiritual gifts because in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, as John records and draws to an end there this gospel record, he says, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So he's recording these miracles, and Jesus performed them to help us to, to believe. In Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, we see that, that there was a means of transmitting these miraculous spiritual gifts to Christians by the laying on of the hands of the apostles. And that was the only way they could be transmitted. Now, Philip had gone and preached to Samaria, and the whole city had responded to the gospel, but they didn't have these miraculous spiritual gifts. And when Peter and John came from Jerusalem and laid hands on them, then they received them. So they were something that were transmitted by the laying on the hands of the apostles. And so, for a number of reasons, we can conclude, and we can be absolutely sure, that these miraculous gifts have ceased. One is because the confirmation of the word for which they were given has now taken place. Mark chapter 16 verse 20. When they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Now, that which is perfect has come, the word has been completed, it has been confirmed, the need for miracles is no longer there's no longer any apostles to pass on those miraculous gifts. So we know without any doubt, without any doubt, the Bible reveals to us that has stopped. But here's what we know that's even better. The love that was to be the motivation for those things 
It's the very same special love that we have today in our joy in Christ. And it is that love that will cause us to give the best to our master, and to treat our brothers and sisters and others that we meet in life with the same love with which he has loved us. It is that love which will enable us to forgive. It is that love which will enable us to sacrifice. And it is that love when people see it living in us. It is that love. Now people will see and they will say, I want that. I want what those folks have. And the more that we show it, the more that God has shown it. Do you love God? And most people will answer that question, yes. I love God. What, what do your actions say about that? The choices that you make. Are you motivated by God to be pure in your thoughts? Are you motivated by God to have the fellowship of those who will help you spiritually and not bring you down? Are you motivated by God to have purity in your entertainment, your music, your movies, everything? Are you motivated by God to truly give Him your life? And so, child of God, you and I need to take 1 Corinthians 13 to heart. It's real easy for us to get into a routine, and to go through the motions. And I want to know, God knows. And you and I need to know of ourselves. Am I motivated by love? And if not, if my actions haven't shown what my mind says should be, then now's the time to make that right. You know, we're all striving to get to heaven and, and we're all trying to help each other and we are human and we will fail. You can count on it. The wonderful grace of God is the power that enables us to understand forgiveness, to receive it, to give it, to move on, and to help each other. And so if we can pray with you and for you, we want to do that. As we sing this song, we're going to ask you, child of God, if you have that need to let us pray with you, we want to help you. And we need your help. And if you're not a child of God this morning, and you're of an age to understand that you need to give your life to God, I have a question for you. Have you yet been baptized into Christ? And if the answer to that is no, and why? I'm certain you want a loving relationship with God. I am just as certain that you can't have it until you come to Him on His terms. Not because of any knowledge of mine, but because of what the Bible says. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shepherds. And so Paul was asked a question, Saul at the time, by Ananias in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, when he came to him and he said, now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so the question from the word of God given to him, to, to us today, for someone who has not yet responded to the Lord in baptism, and yes, I'm putting the pressure on because it's that important, is this. Why are you waiting? What are you waiting on? If you're waiting on God to provide the answer, he's already done that. He sacrificed his son for you. If you're waiting on God to love you, he's already done that. He loves you deeply. If you're waiting on, on a, a, a reason then how about this one? Showing God just how much you love Him. Sacrificing yourself. What greater reason could there be? You want to go live with Him in heaven forever? You want to be with Him forever? 
That's one way. Repent of your sins. Turn away from the life of sin. Confess Jesus as the Son of God. Be buried with Him in the waters of baptism today. Through that act, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it is through that act that you put Him on in baptism. You, you engage in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as you die to sin, buried into that watery grave like He was buried in the grave, rising from that grave as He arose from the grave, victorious over sin, victorious over hell, victorious over death, granted eternal life. That could be yours. Would you come? We stand the same.